Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Very, very big welcome and uh, for this lovely chat with a very talented Mike Bithell. Uh, you probably know him from loads of games that he's made, including Thomas Was Alone, Subsurface Circular. He's also working on a little project to do with Tron, I believe, at the moment. I am. The Disney snipers are at the back of the room. <laughs> um. We are going to touch on that, and uh, we are going to come to your questions as well at the end, so do have those ready. Um, we're just going to sort of be looking into your career a little bit, um, sort of tips for indie developers, that kind of thing. Um, so I guess just starting off, quite an obvious question, but how did you get into the games industry and why? Oh, um, <laughs> I was a t the honest answer is I was um, really bad at animation. Um, that's the main one. So I went. I wanted to. I wanted to. I was. I was into computer games um, as a as a kid. I <laughs> my parents wouldn't let me have a games console because they were worried I'd ruin my life on video games. Um, right. I like to bring that up at Christmas. It's good. Um, but no, I um. I, so I had a I had a PC for you know school stuff, um, and I got to. I kind of played kind of writing little bits of code and stuff. So I was always interested in. In, in computer games from like that perspective, but it didn't really occur to me that you could get a job like coming up with games. I figured it was a job where, you know, the computer did that bit, and then there were artists who made, I understood animation art, so I ended up trying to become an animator, and I literally showed up to like a university interview, and apparently just talked about how, about game design for like the whole interview, and the person who was interviewing me said, you don't sound like you're an animator, you sound like you're a game designer, and I said, what's that? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then it turns out, amazingly, they were willing to sell me a three-year degree in computer game design, uh, and that kind of got me started. Um, but yeah, that, and I just kind of went from there, and it was, it was, yeah, it was a really, it was, it was a trial by fire, and I definitely kind of went in, uh, I'm very grateful to, to that degree, it was uh, Newport Uni. Um, for hey, <laughs> wow, <laughs> cool. Um, and it was, it, I was really grateful for that because I think it opened my eyes. So I was definitely like a kid who played Halo and not a lot else. And I think going to university just opened my eyes to like a lot of opportunities and possibilities, um, <laughs> which I've squandered uh, for the 15 years since. <laughs> yeah. And then looking at, you know, you get into Thomas Was Alone, which I believe was a Flash game first. It was. Right? Flash was um, how websites used to not work. Um, and yeah, it was, a, it, was like a, yeah, it was a little Flash game I did for Congregate, yeah, and then that kind of found an audience. And what was the inspiration behind that then? Um, <laughs> uh, it, uh, again, and I hate, I hate, it's always, you, people always want you to tell like a story that's like, I was really clever, I knew all the answers and I executed. Um, but actually what happened was I had a friend of mine, uh, me and him were, were, were watching um, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The, the Clooney, Coen Brothers movie. Um, and we thought it'd be really cool to make a video game about characters. We weren't really thinking about the kind of problematic nature of this, but like characters chained together. Like if you had a, a bunch of characters who were kind of tethered to each other and the mechanics you could build around that. Um, and I didn't know how to make chains, so I just made a bunch of characters. And then I made one of them so they could jump higher. And that's basically Thomas Was Alone. Um, and that basically, that was where that kind of mechanically came from. But what was interesting, and, and again, well, I'm really grateful to kind of I guess players uh, on the internet was, um, I put that up as a flash game with no story. I called it Thomas Was Alone um, because, my, <laughs> because the same friend said, you should call it something that sounds kind of, you know, moody so people think it's art. So I called it, <laughs> so I called it Thomas Was Alone just because uh, his suggestion. Were there any other suggestions for what it was going to be called? Uh, there, there, there were a lot of like, Jim's feeling a bit bad today. Um, <laughs> That, that, that kind of thing, because it was that era of indie games, and that was kind of my, my friend's very, very, which he still reminds me of frequently, the, the, he, he came up with the idea, um, and then I called it that. There was no Thomas in the game, but what was weird was on Congregate, in the comments, people decided the red rectangle was Thomas, because that was the first one you played with, and then there was like threads of like that, that little yellow one seems grumpy because he can't jump as high. And it just kind of blew my mind and it was kind of this weird crowdsourced education <laughs> in interactive fiction. Um, and I kind of realized, oh, there's this amazing opportunity to take something that's very simplistic and because of, visually I mean, and then kind of through that simplicity and the, the intersection of that with the mechanics, um, make people feel a certain way about the different rectangles. 
and I thought that that was something I could get done. Um, and the original plan was back then, it was very popular, again, just like 2012 on the internet to do kind of motion typography. So you'd get your, the, you know, your favorite speech from Fight Club and you'd do like text moving along the screen in sync with that. Um, and I was like, oh, that's, that's how I can do the story. And then that didn't really work because I realized I was making the levels different shapes to fit the words and they were therefore not fun because I'd made like, just, I was, it was just a really bad way of making levels. So I cut that and thought I should probably get some voiceover. So I just kind of, again, every stage on Thomas Was Alone made like an accidental choice uh, that, that, you know, ended up being the right one. So I just got very lucky. That's the Thomas Was Alone story. I mean, that's it. a bit of skill. It's a little bit of skill. I, I'll give myself credit that when something worked, I leant towards that. Um, but, but the, you know, the wind was blowing and I, I angled the sail. What pitch did you give Danny Wallace then? I'm really interested. <laughs> how did you sell this game to him? I, did you know him? I didn't know him at all, no. I was, I was also, I, again, so I wasn't, a, I'd never written anything before Thomas was alone. So in order to get myself in the headspace of writing, I used to tell this story and say I was avoiding my, um, my mother-in-law at Christmas. And what I didn't realize is she secretly watches and listens to a lot of stuff I do in public and was kind of so, so, hey, Pat. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's not true. I wasn't avoiding you, um, um, but I, uh, I, I was. <laughs> but I was basically. I wrote it one Christmas, and I was listening to Danny Wallace audiobooks while I did it to get the to just kind of to get the tone. If you're not familiar with Danny Wallace, he's kind of got a kind of a Douglas Adamsy kind of wry kind of uh, style of writing. He does really good audiobooks of his of his stuff. So I basically ripped him off and then tried to find like a voice actor or like a friend who could do like a Danny Wallace voice. And the way he tells the story, and I don't know if it's true, is that he was drunk one night looking at Twitter and saw, I, I tweeted like, oh, I, I really need to find someone who sounds like Danny Wallace. And he apparently, he claims, I think, if, I think it probably there were more steps to this, he claims he was drunk and thought, I do a really good Danny Wallace. <laughs> I just, and he, you know, messaged me and we worked out and he was incredibly generous with his time. Um, I got a very good deal um, and, uh, and yeah, and he was just, he was just amazing. And, and let's be honest, I think Thomas was, I was saying to someone earlier, like, I don't think Thomas Was Alone is an incredibly well-written game. I think it's a very well-voiced game. I think, I think there's, I think it makes the words sound a lot better than they are. And I think that's a massive, massively down to Danny. Um, I think over the last 10 years, I've been trying to become the writer everyone assumed I was when they played Thomas Was Alone um, to, to a greater or lesser extent. I mean, I was going to say, why do you think it was so successful? What, what was that part of it? What were the kind of ingredients you think that... I think, I think, as is often the case, it was unique. I think there wasn't... There were other games that had just been wrecked. And if you don't know what Thomas Was Alone is, it's literally rectangles. Um, it's, it looks like a game where no one's made the art yet. Like, it's, it's just... <laughs> But what was weird was because of the moment, it, again, it's like the moment it came out in, I think people misinterpreted that as an art choice <laughs> rather than a lack of art choice. Um, and and I, was a, I was a graphic designer, so like the colors were nice and they kind of worked together and the scale of objects was, was good and there was, there was that crowdsourced kind of character development from Congregate's uh, comment section. And it, there, was, there was stuff that worked. I don't want to put it down too much, but it was definitely, it was definitely just kind of a lot of, of lucky choices. And then also, 2012 was a completely different era in the indie space. Like, I basically, I, I had a friend who, there was, there used to be a secret, and if this still exists, I'm not invited to it anymore, but there was a secret Valve, like, dinner party, basically, in London every year. Um, I, I think it still does go on, but I don't think I'm on the list anymore. Um, but I wasn't on the list then, so I, I broke into that party because a friend was going, and I basically just kind of went up to someone from Valve, because at that point there was no way of getting on Steam, and said, can you put my game on Steam? And credit to that person, uh, they, they, were like, <laughs> they said, are you the rectangle guy? <laughs> And, and I said, yes, I am. And that's, I've been the rectangle guy ever since. Um, but but they, they kind of, yeah, they kind of, um, they kind of got beyond there. But back then, if you got on Steam, like, you were on the front page for a week. And that's so offensive in the modern context of, of like, to, to what, other, what other indies have to go through coming up. So I'm, I'm always very cautious about trying to, like, point to any major lessons from Thomas Was Alone because the way it got out there and the way it found an audience is just so kind of impossible to reproduce now. I think if there is a lesson, it's that it was unique and interesting to talk about. And I think that still holds true generally, but that's very vague advice that's very hard to kind of follow or, or build a plan around. 
Would you ever go back to it? Would you ever revisit it in some way? I've said I want it to be my last game is going to be Thomas Was Alone 2. I, I've actually, well, actually, there's a longer answer to that, which is I want my last game to be Thomas Was Alone 2, or I want, if I, if I die more prematurely than I hope to, I want my, my friends and family to release Thomas Was Alone 2 and, and you know, make some money from it in my stead. Um, I, I've, I've left very clear, clear plans to sell out immediately upon my death. Um, so I, I want you to buy all that Thomas Was Alone merch uh, uh, to look after my, uh, my friends and family. But yeah, no, it's, um, uh, I, I do want to go back. I think what's really interesting to me about Thomas Was Alone is that it's a time capsule. I can look at it now. Um, and there was an amazing talk earlier about personal games. And I've never really been um, a writer who's made a game that's that personal. But what's interesting is, is all of my games I go back to now, years later, and I can see something that I wasn't aware I was even doing. And Thomas Was Alone feels like a game that is made by someone who was working in kind of the double A machine in the UK and desperately wanted to kind of do their own thing and find collaborators and make something together. Um, and I, I didn't realize that's the cry it was putting out into the universe when I made it. Um, and I think that's what would be interesting about a sequel to Thomas Was Alone would be, you know, 60 year old Mike talking to 20 year old Mike. I think there's an interesting angle there. So I think it's something I'll go back to way down the road, hopefully. And then coming out of that, what was it like that having to deal with that pressure of such a big success and kind of being a bit in the public eye as well? What was, sorry, what was the end of the sentence there? Uh, just what was it like being in the public eye after that and, and just the huge pressure after it? I, it felt... The public eye. The public eye. You know what I mean. <laughs> it needs the quotation mark. Um, it felt massive. Like, it felt very big and scary and it did feel like I was the most famous person in the world, which obviously I wasn't, but it felt that way. Um, and it kind of broke my brain a little bit. And, I, and again, like it's it kind of to the previous point, like volume is a game about a character dealing with being seen by people. And I think that was, again, again I didn't realize I was putting out, I was writing a you know, sci-fi Robin Hood, but like actually there was that kind of, so it was weird. Um, I think I learned a lot about uh, the way I wanted to make games on that project and kind of the way I wanted to kind of uh, I guess move on from that kind of 20 something need for attention towards building something. And I, and like, you know, Volume was a game that was very much still made like, uh, you know, an indie hobby project just with some money in my pocket, basically. Uh, so it wasn't, it, there was no structure, there was no company, there was no, you know, uh, looking after people, there was just no struck, there was no company. It was, there was a company and I called it Bithel Games and I've regretted it ever since um, because back then it was just to, you know, sort out the tax man and now it's just this massive uh, weird ego thing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't building a community to make a game and I think that was something that as I entered my 30s, kind of after volume, I kind of, that became more of the focus for me and, and we started trying to you know, treat people well and build a company to make games rather than um, just kind of look at me, look at me on the internet, which I think, honestly, that was the driving force initially, as it is for most 20-somethings, I assume. I hope so. I hope I wasn't just some awful egotist. But, like, I definitely wanted to be seen. And once I was seen, that was terrifying. And then I realized it wasn't as much fun as I hoped it would be. Um, so I kind of wanted to do something else. What would you say then are the kind of cornerstones of creating that community in, in, in a company? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think it differs mm. everywhere, but, I, but for me, it's it's. Um, I've tried. I've tried really hard to build like a respectful um, place to work. But it's almost it's an interesting thing in in with games companies. It definitely you see this pattern repeat. Most game companies start uh, as like a children in the audience, as a uh, declar declaration against the place they worked previously. Um, and that, <laughs> some kind of colorful language to express that. Like, it, but it's true, like Activision started because a bunch of, <laughs> I, I, I feel like the sign maybe actually was the, was, was an honest depiction of that. Um, the, with, like Activision started because a bunch of game developers wanted to get credit for their work. Activision started as like indies, you know, pushing for their, their message and stuff. I feel like, so I feel like with my company, it was about trying to make somewhere that felt more kind of um, inclusive and collaborative. I don't think we've always got that right, but that was definitely like the objective. Um, and just to do things in kind of a pragmatic way. 
um, and a deliberate way, and I think that's kind of worked well. And I'm, you know, I'm very proud of like you know things like our retention and the way kind of the people who work with me uh, kind of feel about the company they work at. So that's it's going well. You know, you stumble, you make mistakes, but but I'm I'm proud of it. And in terms of you know moving from something like Thomas was alone, and you said volume was still a fairly indie ad hoc. I think is the polite word. Ad hoc. Yeah. Um, oh. Then going to something like Earthshape, which I'm assuming was a much bigger budget. How, how do you move from these smaller project, projects to these bigger budgets, and then back again? So let me tell you. So there was there's this little company called Google, <laughs> and <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're, so Earthshape was Google basically just gave us a lot of money to make a VR game. That's um, that's that's kind of the foundation of that. I'm I'm proud of the game though. It was a, a fun little puzzle game and, and had a cool story and stuff. Um, I had Sue Perkins doing voiceover, which was just delightful because um, I was very into Bake Off at the time, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and and that was very cool. And bored her massively in the recording studio asking her Bake Off questions. Um, but yeah, so that was that was that was you know obviously one that that made sense and kind of let us take a moment and kind of start building up the company. Um, then we moved to the circular games, which is where I guess we we really start to like, as a company, do interactive fiction, um, and and those circular games were kind of these fun, quick projects we could make with a small team uh, and really play to the strengths of who was in the team. You know, we had basically me who I can write. Um, <laughs> that, and, and design, um, and I'm not a good enough coder really anymore to, 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 to be coding these things, as anyone who's played Thomas Was Alone recently can, can attest. Um, but like, uh, we had you know, a great 3D artist, my mate Moo uh, was living downstairs and had some free time and was very comfortable kind of doing some coding for us. Um, and there was just there was this opportunity to make those kind of circular games and start exploring that interactive fiction, which I'd always wanted to do. Um, what was really cool about those projects, though, was that they allowed us um, to basically to make a game while we were waiting for something else to happen. So Quarantine Circular became the project that we basically worked on while John Wick was kind of kicking off. And obviously, as you'd expect, IP, uh, there's a lot of contract negotiations and business stuff um, uh, to kind of go through, and it gave the team something to make while that was going on, because the worst thing you want to do is have a bunch of talented people uh, sat doing nothing. Um, and those circular games are really good because they're malleably able to kind of fit those gaps. Um, in terms of the John Wick uh, game, mm -hmm. John Wick Hex, um, how, how did you get in involved with that? Were, were you a fan of the franchise, or I mean, how did that come across? I, I was definitely a fan of the franchise, I, like, like in the way that I think a lot, everyone who saw John Wick, uh, at that point, the only the first two had come out, but they, I loved them, and especially to the, the lore and the world building and everything, it's, it was silly, but like in the best possible way. Um, and yeah, the way that happened was um, a, a friend of mine, um, Ben Andak, uh, was a producer at Good Shepherd, uh, who's a publisher who'd managed to kind of get into the room to kind of talk about John Wick uh, with, with the folks at Lionsgate. And basically, I was tricked. Ben took me to the cinema to watch, what was it called? Uh, um, Free Fire, the, the Brie Larson. It's really good. Brie Larson, like in a warehouse. It's that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, he took me to see that, and, we came, and it's kind of got a kind of John Wick vibe to it, maybe. Um, and he basically tricked me. He took me to see that movie, and then we came out, and he was like, you know what, Mike? Just, just pulling an idea out of nowhere. What would you do if you had John Wick? And I, of course, being a pretentious indie game developer, was like, I think I'd do a strategy game. Um, I think that would be the way to do it. Like you'd make something about the choreography and the way that that, that kind of gameplay works. Um, and somehow that got into production um, because I basically just kind of kept saying that idea to people. Um, and, and as you'd expect, there's just a lot of, you know, there's a lot of process of talking to many, many levels and you end up in Hollywood pitching and everything. But I think what was really cool about it and what I'm most proud of with it was it was so respectful of what John Wick did for kind of fight choreography. It was really fun. I got to hang out with the um, with the 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 A711 folks, the, the the folks who do the fight choreography for that franchise, and they were just so grateful that we kind of captured their process of kind of staging that action. Um, and it was just really interesting, kind of having that back and forth with them. That we, things we discovered mechanically be things we discovered were mechanically satisfying, synced up with the way they made choices about how they choreographed a scene. And we just that that back and forth learning process was great. And then getting to kind of meet the the director and the team behind John Wick was just yeah, it was a, it was amazing. And I got to learn so much um, and learn how to kind of work with an IP while trying to do something that felt fresh and interesting. Because I'd, I'd worked on IP stuff before when I was working AA, 
Um, and in that situation, we were essentially treated as like, you're, you're making a lunchbox mm -hmm. to an extent. You're making a, a tie-in product. And I think that was, the, that was the experience that showed me that we'd built up enough of a reputation in the industry and outside of the industry that we were actually, we could try and be a bit bolder than that and kind of ask for things. And, and what was amazing was how much you know, a company like Lionsgate was willing to let us do those things and to, to experiment. So yeah, it was a, it was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really proud of the game. I think, I think it's really interesting. Um, it definitely like our most experimental kind of project, which again, an experimental IP game, that was interesting. Um, and definitely uh, set an interesting precedent that we could follow up on. I was gonna say, yeah. Um, I mean, what, were there challenges in, in making um, a game based on a property that already had loads of fans, that people already knew about? What, and what kind of difficulties did you find with that? Uh, that we, there was definitely skepticism when we told them we were making a strategy game. Um, and, and I think there's definitely an audience who look at John Wick and go, well, that's, obviously you do Max Payne or you do like a, an action game. And they're right, like that's a really good game. And, and I think actually was, there was a news story uh, yesterday or the day before that, that maybe that's something people are looking into, which is great. And I, I wanna play, I really wanna play that game. That sounds really fun. Um, but I think, uh, I think the audience, once they saw the game and saw what we were doing, did respond kind of well to it. And we, we did find that audience to the extent that I had to like tweet last night to tell people to stop being mean to the triple a game which which was a weird kind of moment where i was just i was seeing negativity thrown at the at the idea of doing the the obviously going to be fun john wick game and and that was that was an interesting kind of full cycle on that story for me of like of we won people over with that you're a fan of doctor who I'm a massive uh, fan of Doctor Who. If you were given, uh, it, it's it, waned a little oh, in okay. recent uh, years. Oh, okay, but. interesting. Um, but if you were given access to that IP, what would you do? What would I do with Doctor Who? <laughs> this is the problem. Is I have thought of this. I've, I have documents. Um, <laughs> but like, this is the problem because that could actually, you know, uh, theoretically, I could be approached. I think for Doctor Who, I think the thing that's really Difficult. And I've actually had conversations with people who've who've done Doctor Who games in the past because I am interested in this as a as a subject. Once you've made an IP game, there's kind of interesting conversations you get to have behind behind closed doors with other people who've made um, IP games. Um, and and I think the biggest challenge of Doctor Who is obviously you want to play the Doctor, right? That's the interesting character. That's the character who solves problems. That's the character with all the verbs. Um, some of them press the most of them press the red button. Um, but, but like that's the interesting kind of character, but you kind of can't overpower the player in that way. And actually, the Doctor is kind of unknowable. And is it weird for you to step into that that character's shoes? So, I think that would be the interesting challenge. I would love to make a game where you play as the Doctor. I'd love to make a game where you're kind of solving problems um, and and doing cool stuff. I think I really, 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 really like Jodie Whittaker in the role, and I'd love. That would, I would definitely try and do the, the Big Finish style, bring back a previous Doctor with her and do something really interesting. I think that'd be really neat. Um, maybe, one day, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd love that, I think that'd be brilliant. Mm. Um, I, I know you, you, was, you sort of said to me, obviously you didn't want to necessarily give uh, advice to people just starting out because you're, you're not in that I believe position. I used the word dinosaur. <laughs> Um. I was trying to be nice and not mention that. <laughs> um, but I'd be kind of throwing it back on you a little bit. What words yeah. of, of advice were you given oh, uh, that you kind of, you know, still use today? I think, I think, I think definitely the do, do the thing. I think the biggest, the best bit of advice I got was do a thing you can do that you assume most people can't and really think about the answer to that question. That's probably the thing I, I give advice most on. Like that's the, that's the go-to is everyone in the world, every game designer, everyone in this room has an angle that no one else has. They have a perspective. Um, they have an interest. They have something that not, wouldn't occur to anyone else in this room. And that's the thing, very possibly, A, that's gonna make it fun to make something because it's gonna be very personal in that way that it's interesting to you, but also that's the thing that you're equipped to do that no one else is gonna do. So in theory, there's gonna be less competition in the crap. So for me, it would be like, I'm a big musical theater nerd. So I've been, I've been eyeing up musical theater games for a while and unfortunately a couple of my mates are doing a really good one right now and it's annoying. Um, <laughs> but like those kind of things, like, um, you know, I used to do a talk 
years and years ago where I would like say like the same thing I just said and kind of think about the thing you love and you're most passionate about. And then behind me, I'd put up um, Darth Vader, the Xenomorph, and Star something Star Trekky. And I'd be like, if it's those three things, that's like that's a lot of the people who are making games and finding that unique voice. And to be honest, that feels like the advice that's, this is probably the least appropriate audience to give that advice to. Because I think there's just walking around and seeing the variety of games that are on display and the variety of folks showing them, it's, it's very clear that like people are keying into that, but that's, I needed to hear that back in 2012 to answer your question. That was definitely a piece of advice that was useful to me. Um, and, and then I went and made a Metal Gear Solid clone, um, which was, <laughs> you know, maybe not the best uh, kind of, uh, you know, a way to take that advice. But yeah, I've, I've definitely tried to always find those opportunities. With, with the circular games, for example, like I can write quite quickly. So making a very, you know, text heavy game was something that we could do. Um, I'm always trying to find those angles for things that we can do as a studio that maybe other folks would struggle to or would be harder or more expensive for them to do. Uh, I know a big thing that um, some solo devs struggle with is just getting their game out there. And I know obviously it was different for you, like you said, in 2012, but you know, any tips on, on that process now? Um, I would definitely give the advice not to put all of your eggs into a basket that a billionaire might on a whim buy. That would be my... <laughs> that would be a tip. Just kind of don't do one platform very well and neglect everywhere else. Um, that might come back to bite you. Um, I'm on Instagram um, now, as of yesterday. Um, if anyone wants to uh, like and subscribe, you don't like and subscribe on it. So I have no idea. Oh Stories, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm very old. Um, I'm a dinosaur. Um, no, I think I think being being interesting. I think as well. One thing um, that I wish came easier to me. Um, I'm definitely I'm definitely an introvert. I'm definitely, and I know that's ridiculous to say in an audience, with an audience, but like, I'm definitely not in my natural element doing this kind of thing. Um, and I definitely learned that I had two years ago. And I think that's definitely something I had to kind of work through of kind of putting myself out there and assuming anyone would care. I think that's the biggest one, like, because if you're someone who is quite naturally predisposed to constantly litter jokes into conversation about how terrible you are, which is definitely something I do and I've done throughout this. If you're, in, if you're that kind of person, it doesn't occur to you that anyone would want to hear what you have to say or that, you would, that people would care about your work. There's nothing more arrogant in a way than making a piece of art and expecting anyone to care about it. So lean in, L commit to that. <laughs> commit to, to wanting to spread you know, the word about something you, you've, you've made. And I think having the confidence to do that and being bold with it and trying to respect people, but also, you know, push the message. Um, I think having permission to do that is something that didn't come easy to me. And I, I was kind of dragged along into that by Thomas Was Alone just because, you know, I was going around the country with my, my PC under my arm, taking it to events like this. And it started to just pick up steam. I didn't really ask to, I didn't, I didn't ask for this. Um, I didn't kind of build up that kind of uh, thing automatically. And I, I, the people I see doing really well now are the people who are willing to put themselves out there. And that generation of indies that's coming up now, the ones who are making like, you know, five insufferable TikToks a day, <laughs> it's working and you should feel comfortable doing that. That's, that's, they're not wrong to be doing that and to be talking about their stuff. And there's no, there's no heroism in not being seen, I guess. Like it's, like, it's okay to put yourself out there. And, and if you're not naturally predisposed, work out a way you can do it sideways and kind of find a collaborator who is very into that kind of thing or, or, or fake it like I do until you get used enough to it that this kind of situation doesn't bother you as much as it would if you stopped and thought about it for more than a minute. Um. <laughs> Um, we're going to ask a little bit about Tron and then kind of open it to some mm -hmm. questions. I mean, what can you tell us about Tron? And also, how, how did you get involved with that one as well? Um, so that one, actually, that was, that was um, I, they, will, they, they obviously own, uh, Disney owned quite a few things, but they own <laughs> Tron. Um, and they were kind of thinking about doing something in the game space. And honestly, I think my name kind of naturally came up in that conversation, probably because we'd been doing the press rounds with John Wick around that time and kind of, we built up that kind of reputation, um, which was really sweet. Um, and again, they asked me, what would you do with Tron? And, and I had some, some weird ideas, but I think for me, it was very much like, 
I want to I want to do world building. I want to kind of take because Tron is such an interesting sci-fi fantasy space that there's there's really interesting ways to kind of explore that um, and to kind of tell your own story within that context. Um, and yeah, we're doing interesting things. Um, the thing we've announced is um, Tron Identity, which is if you've played the circular games, it's kind of Tron circular to an extent. Like it's definitely more ambitious than those games, um, but it's uh, it's really interesting. And I think I think it's a it's a very natural way to kind of reintroduce this world to players because it's been a while since there's been Tron uh, media. And I think kind of going in and letting you play it's the oldest sci-fi trick in the book. You play a detective, so there's a really good reason for you to ask questions of everyone all the time, um, and uh, which works. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, an, it's a chance to kind of get into that lore, find out about that world. There's so many interesting details in Tron that you can kind of miss in the movies as they're riding past on their light cycles, and I think there's some really good opportunities for storytelling and telling, you know, bringing in new characters, doing interesting stuff. Um, I'm, I'm very nerdy about Tron at this point, and I, I'm working so hard not to just, like, talk about that, but yeah, anyway. Um, yes, there's there's a good opportunity there, and we're doing something interesting, I think. Okay, I'm, I look forward to that. So y you've done the Tron research, then you're telling me you've really gone into it. I I will take questions. I am, <laughs> and the, but that's the reality is like that's I'm a big research focused person anyway. So like, um, <laughs> so Quarantine Circular, for example, we made in I think that came out in 2016. Um, so I just researched epidemiology for like two months and then was the chicken little of my friendship group back in 2019. Because <laughs> I was like, I know what, because uh, uh, this was a point where people didn't know what, you know, an R number was. Like that was, and it was, yeah. So, so it can also go wrong. You can learn too much about the wrong subject and you can kind of mess yourself up. But yeah, so research is always where I start. So like, yeah, with, with Tron, it's, yeah, I'm, I have consumed everything I can. Um, obviously, uh, you get access to interesting stuff uh, you're building on the shoulders of, of giants with this stuff, and there's there's lots of really, that's where it's interesting. I think if you treat it with the respect for the the work that's been done before and try and then, you know, do a little bit more on top of that, I think you're in the right kind of uh, wheelhouse with that stuff. That's a point where we will throw it open to anyone who wants to ask any questions. Awkward. There you go. Oh, you, you make sense mine, surely. <laughs> we'll just... Right at the back. Oh, no, there's, there's one there. There you go, there. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, hi. I have a question um, about something you said before. You said that when you approached um, the producers of John Wick, if I understood correctly, there was actually no desire on the other side to make a game. You had to convince them that this is something that's worthwhile for them to do. Unlike Tron, where you were already you know, familiar for your work. Oh, no, no I, I, so uh, apologies that I misspoke. I definitely didn't have to, get, no, they, they wanted to do a John Wick game, for sure. They wanted. They did. What's, what's, um, what's interesting, so, so you know how every Hollywood movie, um, it, like romantic comedy say, there's always this, the thing where someone has to prepare for a big presentation? And you've, who in this room has ever had to prepare for a big presentation as an adult? Like, a couple. Right, but those were mostly you pitching things, right? And that's what it is, is in Hollywood, 90% of your job is to just convince other people that what you're doing is the right thing. So, so while there was definitely interest in doing John Wick and, and that, I had to re-pitch that idea a lot and kind of talk to people. Um, and that's definitely a part of working within Hollywood is kind of uh, ju justifying yourself and your choices. Um, and it's, I, I think it's a good thing. It definitely makes you kind of confident in what you're presenting because you have to kind of redo that a lot. Um, so yeah, it wasn't that I was convincing them to do a John Wick game. It was convincing them that I was doing a good job of doing the John Wick game, which is uh -huh. a, a, a very important uh, difference. But yeah, it was, a, it was interesting. But I think that makes the idea stronger because you are constantly kind of challenging yourself in that way. And how, how did they react? I mean, I, we, we all know the games take a very long time to make. Yeah. And so when you told, told them games going to take, I don't know, a year, two years to make, how did that exactly fit into their production schedule and the marketing schedule? Yeah, I mean, uh, honesty, obviously, up front, and we did a pretty good job of guessing how long it would take us. I think we were a little bit longer than we said, but I think we were pretty close. Um, 
the big thing, the key thing, the thing that I've seen happen in, my, in the duration of my career, just from, like I said, working on, I worked on iCarly back in the day, if anyone of a certain age remembers iCarly. Um, I worked on a game for that uh, way back when. Like, the big thing that's changed is now the people in the suits across the table grew up playing video games. That's the fundamental change. And that means as well that they probably grew up looking at games press, they saw the E3 announcement and then knew they had to wait a little while to see the actual game at the end of it. Like, I was going into meetings with people who knew this stuff. Um, and, that's, and, and, and that's actually one of the really cool things about working on Tron is obviously Tron people are into video games, shock horror, right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's an even more of that awareness. So because of that awareness, I think that helps a lot with the communication. It's not, they know that these things take time and they respect the, your process. Um, I think as, as in any kind of you know, business relationship or partnership, it's just about being upfront and honest and just going, this is not giving them a fake <laughs> date basically. Um, so yeah, that went well. Hands over him. <laughs> He's getting a good workout, isn't he, today? Uh, hi, Mike. Hello. Uh, possibly a bit of a niche one. There's a, there's a kind of narrative in a few of your games that sort of visits the player while they, while they stay put. Like, subsurface circular is the really obvious one, but Ark Smith and the Solitaire Conspiracy both kind of do it as mm. well. Um, how much is it a kind of story you like writing and want to build a game around versus the kind of story you need for a game you're building? And do you have any tips for pulling it off? Yes. Um, so it's definitely, obviously, partially budget-led, that making one room is, is cheap. Um, <laughs> my, my girlfriend um, calls, she, she describes my favorite genre of film as men in a room talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> like sarcastically, that's her description. Um, and I do like like chamber pieces, basically like small, concise stories in like a locked in location. And that, and that definitely comes into the, the games as well. But yeah, it's often just kind of a logical, like Solitaire Conspiracy took four months. And honestly, three and a half months of that was just editing the bloody FMV cutscenes. Um, but like there was, yeah, there's, there's a briefness to those projects, subsurface as well. Like, so that's where that came from. I think it's cool. I think it's a nice way of telling like a little theatrical story about specific small number of characters. I think it can feel very constraining though. And definitely when we're making games that last a bit longer, we tend to try and scale that up a little bit. Um, and, 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 and have with some future stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, I think um, it, it was a combination of my own taste aligning with the realities of just developing a game, yeah. Did your um, uh, research for Quarantine Circular <laughs> affect your experience of the actual pandemic? Uh, yeah, they, they flew me around the world to give lectures to uh, <laughs> um, Fauci. Um, no, I... It, no, it, it, it meant that I was the person in my friendship groups going, this, this is legit, like a little bit earlier. And, and I, so it was mostly just scary. But what was weird was then everyone became an expert in epidemiology, or at least to the level I was, like of kind of people started to learn what the words meant and kind of understood kind of what these, these things were. Um, but no, it's honestly the only kind of lasting outcome of that is just, so I do a podcast with a, with a few friends um, called Play, Watch, Listen. Um, and um, <laughs> Alana, whose channel it's on, um, thanked me because early on in the podcast, when all of this was starting off, ours was one of the few podcasts that wasn't just doing jokes about how everyone was overreacting, because I was in the room being chicken little and being like, no, this is legit, this is legit. Um, so it, that's the only kind of lasting thing, is we, our podcast looked a bit less silly than some other podcasts. It's not a massive kind of win, to be honest, <laughs> on a global scale. I think we have time for one more. Yes. Hand. Hi. Um, yeah. I just want to say that I really enjoyed your GDC talk on dialogue as level design in Subsurface Circular. Yeah. Um, about how like you can get information from characters that works as keys to unlock rooms as just more information. Um, and I was curious about because you've made more circular games and you're obviously you said that you're using it as inspiration for the Tron game how that's evolved since then and how you plan to use it, if you can talk about it in the Neutron? Yeah, so I, I think it's been, for me, this is the problem when like you accidentally get successful with an early game in your career. 
I've been kind of learning in public this whole time. So like subsurface circular, you're, you're, it, it was fun, and that was a fun talk to do, because essentially I was talking about how it uses keys and doors, basically, in terms of how you're unlocking kind of information in that game, which I thought was really clever. And then you look, and obviously interactive fiction folks have been talking about that for like 20 years, um, which, is, which is humbling. Um, I think it was interesting for that game with Quarantine Circular, I pushed the focus a little more to being about relationships and between the characters. And I think I was successful and unsuccessful to different degrees with that from like a writing perspective. There's definitely some stuff in there that people rightly were quite annoyed by. Um, and I, I definitely took that to heart. I would say, yeah, I can't say much about I, Tron Identity, but definitely it's leaning more in the kind of um, character-led story direction than the kind of locked door and key kind of mode, just because I think that with Tron, you need that momentum of storytelling. With, with Subsurface Circuit, it's very much a game about being stuck. You know, you're on a train, you're kind of talking to three different people to find the thing, okay, I've got the thing, now I can go over there. Whereas with Tron, you want to be racing through it. And I think even if it's a game like Tron Identity is where there's a lot of dialogue and it's men, 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 men and other people in a room talking, um, even in that context, you want that pace and that rhythm of movement. And I think that was ultimately what guided some of the choices we're doing there. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for having a chat with us. Uh, it flew by. <laughs> so thank you so awesome. much. <laughs> thank you.